Committee of the Whole is uh, back in order from recess. Um, Senator Sabina, do you have any questions to the panel? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for um, spending a good part of the day uh, addressing our questions. And, um, you know, a lot of the great questions were asked before, and um, I don't want to belabor some of the points, uh, but there is something uh, that I would like to get clarified in regarding, um, you know, should the, the primary be canceled, um, what, what kind of preparations are made um, in regards to um, holding a fair general election when you have people from the same party competing uh, for the same um, position? So what are some of the, perhaps you, ha you haven't gone this far, but um, are there any plans in place to address that sort of situation? to ensure fair elections. Uh, this question can go to the executive director, it could go to um, Pat Seville, uh, perhaps even uh, A.G. Camacho. Senator, could you clarify, I, I understood the part about, so you have two candidates from the same party running for the same office. And and then could you go on from there, please? I'm just not sure I understood quite what you were asking. Yeah, so uh, what? how would you handle, uh, let's say, a race where it's contested by the same party and where it could perhaps be splitting the vote? Um, how would you um, ensure that um, the election is fair? Yeah. Well, hmm. the fairness, the fairness first comes in making certain that all the votes are counted and that they're accurately counted. Um, so I, I guess what I, I think what you're asking though is, um, is it fair that that two candidates from the same party would advance to the general election. I think the 
the more the situation is if by splitting the vote that um, may have reduced the chances of perhaps that candidate uh, becoming elected by canceling the primary. Wow. Okay, that, you know, I, I, I will defer to the parties on that. Uh, this is not something the independent candidate usually runs into here. So let me defer to the parties on that. So you're deferring to the parties on the representatives on the GEC commission? Is that what you're saying? Or are you deferring to... Well, yeah, I, you know, I don't see this as, you know, when you say a fair election and, and splitting the vote, well, Senator, I, I think you have, I mean, you have uh, people who aren't happy with the primary. Of course, they could s switch parties. Uh, party loyalty is not what it used to be. So I, I'm not sure that, so you're, you're not just splitting the vote two ways. I mean, there, let's say you have two Democrats and two and one Republican on the general ballot. Well, you still have you, you have three candidates. So now instead of uh, the, the vote being being split two ways, it's actually split three ways. And, and I but I think what you're suggesting is you're focusing on the split between the the two Democrats that that a loyal Democrat going to the, the, uh, into the election, if there were two Democrats, then he would you know, vote for one or the other and that splits the vote. But I, I, that seems a little bit narrow because you have, you know, you have, uh, there, there's, you have uh, other candidates and, and I'm not sure that party loyalty is, is is all is quite as as strict as you think. Okay, um, the Attorney General Camacho, would you have a response to that? I mean, really, it's just a matter of um, we've limited our opinion to the effects of canceling and, and whether you know the specific questions that were asked of us, but. I really think that it would just come down to if that is a concern that the legislature has trying to, to think of a process that would minimize um, any potential argument that you could, you could make down, down, the, down the road. So um, I mean, primaries aren't a matter of right. It's something that the legislature has determined is an appropriate way of you know, going from a set number of candidates to 15 and they advance to the, to the general. So, there is nothing to prevent the legislature, just as it has the authority to cancel outright, from determining procedures that would govern this election if it is a little bit different than, than past general elections. All right, thank you. Um, in regards to, let's say, postponing the election, so we heard some very good testimony regarding some of the logistical issues regarding that. Um, in regards to mail-in voting, so, you know, obviously, um, you know, we, we faced this, this question before us about canceling the primary, and in, in those circumstances were different where the, the curve was uh, a flattened, and now we're dealing with the second surge, and we're in PCOR 1. So, you know, thinking about moving forward, I mean, to kind of address some of these issues uh, you know, in, in the election, as far as melon voting, I feel like would be, you know, the, the you know, uh, protective of the community, or at least one of the, the uh, means to protect the community and also protect the, the right to vote. Um, so Executive Director um, Pangolinan, could you ex uh, maybe clarify, or at least can you reiterate what is a timeline to develop best practices in regards to uh, mail-in voting? And can it be done if the election was postponed? The answer is no, Senator Paris. Um, as um, people have mentioned Hawaii, Hawaii did it 
uh, they passed the law in 2019, so they had a whole year to, to do mail-in ballots. Um, there are uh, processes that the GEC has to learn, and um, within the short time, um, we don't have that luxury of putting in mail-in ballots at this time now. Thank you. And then, so you were saying that given enough time, um, just wondering how much time would that require? Should uh, <laughs> should there uh, should mail-in voting be an option? At least a year, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Barris. Senator Therese Trelai, do you have any questions, ma'am? Yes, Mr. Chair. So the bill is, um, in my mind, divided into two parts. There's one that's, you know, proposing that we cancel the primary, and the second part proposes a mail-in. So first, to just the canceling of the primary. Um, you know, we had the opportunity, of course, to cancel this primary six weeks ago when we were considering it. And my position is the same. It's about public health, ensuring whether the election commission is truly ready to do this safely, uh, in conjunction with Department of Public Health and the Physicians Advisory Group. Back then, they made it very clear to us that it was a daunting task, even at that time, to hire enough staff and train them for the primary. They said they could be ready, but they also said the more time they had, the more they could use it to recruit, train, and learn from other jurisdictions and coordinate with public health. GEC testified back then, this was about July 14, that it was difficult even then to recruit and that they were concerned about their employee safety, of course. They told us of the potential need to take 22 nurses from other critical workstations to man these precincts and that they were considering using, you know, multiple places on the campuses of the schools. Uh, and of course, this was just, you know, it would have been this weekend, which is a time when the campuses had just, you know, opened up and been clean for school to begin. And of course, we know DOE is continuing to do food distribution due to the pandemic. So GEC has told us today that their real, their only real recommendation is if we postpone, it's got to be September 12th. And that uh, I think we've heard from the other witnesses that postponing would not necessarily alleviate the health concerns. It might cause additional effort and potential risk for GEC to conduct that election on that day, count the votes through that night, and then get that general ballot out right after that. Um, I remember that the governor postponed the Jotnia special elections, and uh, I you know, but I, I just don't think she, she was obviously not willing to do that for this for this election, despite PCOR 1. So we tried um, to mitigate by allowing for in office voting. And I respect the many people who exercise that option. And 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 I also that we had a public hearing on that option, Mr. Chair. So I just think that we must ensure safety so that we do not risk even more spread of this virus. It, it's, uh, we're still in that moment. And, it, you know, conditions change every day. And that's, uh, we've seen our numbers go up in a matter of days. And uh, so unfortunately, this effort failed about six weeks ago, but we have that opportunity again to ensure safety. So if I could ask the, uh, first the Attorney General, You know, so, um, well, public health. According to the governor's executive order 27, by the end of August 14th, there was about 88 COVID positive cases that we know of. One week later, uh, August 24th, indicated positive cases for 255. This is the third week, and we are, there were 136 positive cases as of last night, August 26th. Uh, I wanted to ask you, given the bed capacities at the ICU at GMH um, and ventilator capacity and nursing capacity, can we say uh, 
well, do we have any idea, I guess, when, uh, I mean, could you state for the record whether these have been met? Have we met those capacities or have we exceeded those capacities or where are we at in, in regards to those? I'm trying to make it clear, Mr. Chair, on our record here in the legislature for legislative history as to whether we have a compelling uh, need that we're trying to resolve here. I, I'm looking for public health. Are they all gone? Oh, there's uh, the deputy director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, and good afternoon. And, uh, you know, in regards to capacity here with the different services that we're working on, you know, it, it actually changes uh, throughout the day. Uh, we stand ready to make sure that uh, we've got space over at QFAC. Uh, and we were able to work through JIC and the, and the National Guard to secure uh, Outrigger, uh, which gives us more space and actually helps consolidate a lot of our services. So that's been a very big positive, especially as, you know, staff, uh, some may get sick or what have you. And, and so with limited staff or resources, then it gives us a chance to focus on them all in one area. But I do know too that, you know, Guam Memorial Hospital uh, has its challenges as well. And so, you know, getting people through uh, the emergency room or out of IC and getting them into the isolation facility uh, really helps take the pressure off. So are we asking, have we uh, met our capacity you know, that varies according to what is happening at that particular moment in time. Uh, but have we been challenged? Oh, absolutely. You know, these numbers, obviously, the data in many ways speaks for itself. Uh, the numbers are out there. People are clearly testing positive. And, uh, you know, whether they're following the simple guidelines or even having challenges with them, the point is, is people are, are testing positive. So are we challenged? Uh, on a daily basis to some degree. You know, we wanna make sure that we have everything in place. Uh, but of course, you know, between our ISO, our QFAC, between Guam Memorial Hospital, of course, and uh, public health, you know, for each person who tests positive, we wanna make sure that contact tracing is in place. Of course, contact tracing when effective, and it's been quite effective, uh, brings more people in for testing. Uh, and then, of course, with more testing, you know, you, you find out more and more what's going on in your community. And, and that simply means, you know, the numbers of negatives and the more numbers that are positive that are out there. And then that bleeds back into more contact tracing. So if the legislature is looking at whether we've reached our capacity, uh, in many ways we have not. But we definitely have met with, through the day through some challenges. Uh, to make sure that things continue to run smoothly. Fortunately, we've got some excellent partners, and I do know that they're uh, working uh, diligently on a second uh, isolation quarantine facility, and I know that will really help uh, take some more of the pressure off over at the emergency room in the IC area of Guam Memorial Hospital. All right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, if I could just ask then, so if we have the primary on September 12th, um, and we expect, I, I think they were saying, at least 35,000, up to 50,000 people to attend. Do you believe that the positive positivity rate will increase? You know, I think the data speaks for itself. I think when people come together and cluster, and we know that's a natural process, I know that uh, some people, as they go through the day, perhaps become more lax about the social distancing, which is important, and the mask wearing and the uh, hand sanitizing etiquette, regardless of you know whether masks are even made available or whether sanitizer is made available, there's still a level of uh, touching, hugging, things like that yes. that can take place, and uh, you have those opportunities it's for transmission. So yes, as the numbers increase, okay. people cluster, obviously the numbers of potential right. infections will go up. Okay, so if they're gonna go up by 50, mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that, that um, the hospital would be able to accommodate that? I, I guess I'm trying to find, I was going to ask, you know, when, when do we reach, uh, like what kind of risk are you saying we are able to take in order to, uh, you know, conduct an election? Can we, can we risk 50 more patients, 100 more patients, or 150, you know, what would that be? 
I think if you have uh, rot 35 uh, thousand people who are voting, you're, you're going to get, in my opinion, which of course should not necessarily always be the public health opinion, but my personal opinion is that you're going to get more than 100 infections. And so uh, uh, will that overwhelm the system? It definitely will challenge it. Uh, and so and so, I know, of course, obviously today we have our 10th death. And when you look at how things have mapped out over the last month, you know, the number of new infections uh, have increased dramatically. Uh, are we in a good place to be able to uh, hold an election uh, and take the chance, roll the dice, as to whether people will uh, not infect each other or cough on each other or yes. uh, hug each other or not wear their mask? On, on. Uh, I, think, I think it's a... It's a a possibility, a very strong possibility that people will. And and therefore, again, our numbers will go up. Uh, okay, so today's uh, August 27. Do you have the same opinion if the election is held on September 12? In my personal opinion, I, I do. I know that uh, it's always good if uh, Guam Memorial Hospital representative is on board. Uh, but, you know, this has taken this uh, measure, this situation, of course, that we're in right now has moved very, very quickly. Uh, and ironically, it's moved quickly in the number of new infections, uh, but it's been very slow to actually taper down. So, okay. you know, definitely the governor is making every stride uh, to make sure those numbers actually are, are lowered. But um, the data for now shows that our numbers continue to increase. So whether I think that the numbers are going to be in a much better place by the time of the election. I think the patterns uh, sort of speak for themselves as well. Um, and so I would be very concerned, not only as Deputy Director of Public Health, but just as a person in the community who actually would want to go vote, uh, but really have to think twice about the risk that I would be taking. Um, and that's concerning. You know. Yeah, so I kind of think people need to step into the voting arena, not having to worry about a life or death choice, but something that they are more engaged in, their candidates and uh, wanting Would to you, know their candidates' capability. Are you describing it as a life and death choice to go in on, I mean, September 12th and vote? You know, I, you know no, not necessarily. I mean, it's every time I drive to McDonald's, I'm taking a life or death choice. Uh, so, but I'm also just... Clearly, there's an element of risk involved uh, for the number of new infections that could take place uh, if we were to do a face-to-face -face, uh, election such as this, I would say in the near future. September 12th? Would be the near future. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. And then um, if I could just ask the Attorney General, if the... Um, so we're in PCOR 1 right now, but... It looks like that will end on September 4th. Uh, the emergency continues to September 30, but PCOR 1 or this uh, home lockdown is only until September 4th. Are, um, it, that's, I don't know what PCOR we're gonna be in, but if, if we are in PCOR 1 on, on September 12th, are we allowed to vote in the primary? And conduct the primary? Uh, I mean, I, I think we've seen the, the governor can modify the executive orders as needed. So if the election were to proceed as, as currently scheduled or even postponed, uh, you know, I, I think the governor would be put in a position where she would probably have to modify the executive order at that point to allow for voting. But, All right. Well, sorry. Again, that's not what really... About what about for tomorrow? So, I mean, sorry, it's Saturdays. Uh, the current date for the election is this Saturday, right. and we would be, uh, looks like, still in PCOR 1 under the current executive order. I, I think it would put everyone in a very, th there would be conflict. I mean, I think the Guam Election Commission is, has been trying to comply to every extent with the governor's executive orders, but if they had a legal mandate on one hand to move forward with the election on Saturday, and an executive order. Um, I'm not sure if Attorney Diaz would jump in here, but 
I, I think that they would be required to follow the statute at that point. And they, they would be put in, and not in a good situation, but I, I think they would be required to follow what the law says. Oh, okay. I see. Mm -hmm. but by following statute, you mean go forward with the election? If there was a conflict between an executive order and a statute that says that the primary election shall be held this Saturday, um, I, again, I don't think the, the election commission wants to be put in that position, but I think at that point they would have an obligation to follow what Guam statutes uh, require and then try to comply as best as they could with the executive order. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a few questions for the mail-in that I was going to hold till round two, but if you'd allow me to just finish those, I could do that right now. Uh, uh, please, we're, we're going to get a round two anyway, but you, oh, you can finish it off. Sure. You're still within your five minutes. Okay, no so problem. this is now regarding mail-in and other options. So the, um, you know, this did not have a, its own public hearing, and so it, I don't think it's really been vetted by the Department of Public Health yet. Uh, or GEC fully, and I know that uh, Attorney Seville, you said that uh, you believe that the early voting method is safer, uh, uh, but that it, I'm getting the consensus that uh, it's not clear how GEC is going to go forward to address all these health concerns for the general election and that you still have to um, determine that and that you want to have some time and give us a recommendation on it. Uh, but will the, um, can the legislature cancel in-person voting? Is, is that legally allowed? I guess I'm gonna ask the Attorney General that. Uh Senator, I, I think there have been I mean, several jurisdictions that have actually gone to all mail-in, but they've just had an, an adequate amount of time to get those uh, procedures in place. So I, I do think it is permissible to have um, all ballots submitted through the mail. I, I don't think that would violate any constitutional rights. For the general. For the, the general. I, I think the executive director's point is they just need time to vet and to make sure that GEC is prepared. Sorry, yeah. Sorry if I'm speaking for you, Maria. And so that you're, you're speaking about the, for the general election, correct? And so that means that there's no organic act issue with that. I, I don't think that, I mean, again, I, I, this is just in trying to, okay. to research for the opinion this today, but I, I recall seeing three or four states that have gone as a result of COVID-19 to all mail-in voting. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think that there are constitutional implications if that's the way that the legislature wants to move forward. All right, because you said the Organic Act dictates the date we're going to hold the election. So holding the election by um, mail-in or voting centers on different dates, uh, would, that, would that defy that Organic Act mandate of a certain date, or that would be allowable? And again, I'm, um, the executive director is much more familiar with this, but I think the, the in-office and the absentee ballot is just a way that someone can vote or submit their ballots, but then the votes themselves are not cast until the election day. Okay. And then the law allows for 10 additional days for both, for ballots to be received. And then uh, again, I'm not sure what the, the procedures would be, but it's not as though if I've gone into the, and uh, Maria, you you guys were great too. I did exercise, I went in early and I voted and I, they were very great down there. Um, but when I put my, my ballot into the, the box it's not being counted at this point you will okay. wait until um, election day is set by statute and i think the the procedure is you actually read out the name you evaluate to make sure it complies and at that point it, it is cast into a ballot so i don't think that there would be any constitutional issues if you were to expand the ability of people to submit votes in alternative ways other than in person all right thank you okay mr chair you want it to go to round two i'll wait thank you all right thank you Senator Kelly, you have a few questions, ma'am, to the panel. Thank you. Sisus Masi, Mr. Chair.
there was one question uh, for the Attorney General. So we had talked about for the GEC to carry out the election, they would have to get an exception. Uh, would, would the community also need an exception to be able to go out and, and frequent uh, the, the voting site? You know, I, I think there actually might be, well, yes. I mean, the best case scenario would be there would be no conflict with uh, between the executive order and, and any election. Um, I'm sorry if that, if that answers your question. Uh, yes, Senator. no, we had a uh, very loud thunder over here. And so we were making sure that we were still on. Often uh, rain and thunder can uh, knock out the internet. So the other is, um, it was good that in a sense that uh, the Guam Election Commission had some of these different opportunities uh, through the Jotnia election, through the early election option um, that we passed just recently so that they could test out what works and, and not um, and, and see that they can perhaps build on this for the general election. So it was asked about the maximum number of days to expand that early voting, and it sounds like some of that's still being worked out. Could it be as early if GEC has their logistics in place? Could it be as early as when uh, the delegate ballot needs to be readied by? Yes, ma'am. Is that question for me? Hungin, and if you could let us know when <laughs> that date is so that we can calculate the number of days. It's September 18th, 45 days before the election. Actually, it's 46 days before the election, but since Saturday is September, since September 19th, the 45th day is a Saturday, we have to send it out by September 18th. So it's 46 days before the election, ma'am. So Juice Masi, I, I wanted to make sure that I understood that correctly. And, you know, one of the things, um, gosh, I've been, thinking about this since March, but, um, you know, trying to come up with a solution because we know that the general election, it, it, there is no postponing it, there is no canceling it. And so we have to come up with these uh, solutions. And so I applaud GEC for all of their diligence. I know that they've been likewise, um, just really, really studying this and reaching out. So for the number of staff, I've been wondering how can we best safeguard making sure that the number of staff and uh, precinct officials and the others are there. Uh, for the Attorney General, can, can we actually ask, not the legislature, but GEC, if they wanted to ask their staff to quarantine, let's say for 14 days beforehand, do they have that ability or no? I I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. You know, I, I think that's a, that's an interesting personnel issue and or a human resource issue, and I I, I can try to get an answer for you, Senator, and I, and I can follow up after this uh, this meeting. Well, and I'm just looking for anything that might be a tool. I know that there was a football team that had to quarantine, so that's that's my reference. Um, of course, that's different. That's not government. And perhaps we need to, as a government, just make sure that we're really sending out these strong advisories, not to let our guards down so that we're doing our part to make sure that we're not spiking. What if um, we were to, or if the, the governor commits to providing logistical support? Uh, we mentioned possibly National Guard. We know that cabinet members have been used. Uh, just things like that, would that be able to give perhaps the additional people to have a buffer or a safeguard or 
just know that that flexibility is there. Does, does that sound like uh, something that would be a useful tool uh, for the GEC? So Maria or Mike or Alice? Um, I think it would be uh, a useful tool and I leave it to the executive director how she would use that tool. Maria, you can chime in. Um, uh, thank you. Um, you know, just like any, um, any activity, we need to plan, organize, influence, and control. So I want to talk, you know, depending what resources become available to us, we will optimize its use. Um, right now, uh, as we, you know, as we go further, we want to know what we have, uh, what, what the Guam Election Commission is obligated to do. And I didn't mean to leave out Pat, so I was trying to be thorough with the uh, GEC there. <laughs> Um, also, you know, we've seen that the Department of Labor had uh, really good results in reaching out to some of these experts, and there are just so many considerations. Um, GEC has done a very good job in trying to think of every contingency, every best practice, and they're still researching this. Would hiring a consultant of some sort to advise or do some of the logistical work, would that help with GEC? Um, Senator, um, you know, we, the Guam Election Commission has its resources with regard to best practices. Uh, we have the Department of Public Health and Social Services. We have Election Assistance Commission. And we're, I've already, we've already reached out to people who are, um, who are experts at vote by mail and, um, and other things. So with regard to hiring a consultant, Consultant, we'd have to tell that consultant all the uniqueness or the differences or the distinction of the Guam election process. Um, Senator, one more thing. Um, the both the legislature and the governor and the, the judicial branch even, both, all of them have reached out to us, to, or I reached out to them to, to ask for assistance. Um, very recently, uh, we got word that maybe cabinet members can be precinct officials. Well, it's a long standing policy that was uh, put together by the Guam Election Commission Board that cabinet members are not allowed to be registrars voter registrars, nor precinct officials. So again, to address your question about consultant, um, the learning curve to teach them the distinct, the, the uniqueness, not uniqueness, but the differences in how elections are conducted when we're so isolated, that's something that's a, um, you know, that's something, there's not enough time to do that before the consultant can be effective. Thank you. And for the Attorney General, what other U.S. territory or state has canceled their primary election? You know, I keep on getting people reaching out to me talking about how we've had our elections through the Civil War and through the Spanish flu and these other things. Where are we at right now in the United States? Uh, Senator, I, I honestly I don't know the answer to that. I, I haven't really been following elections in other jurisdictions, um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if maybe someone else on the election commission would would have an answer for that. So, if uh, the director, I, I know she follows these things pretty closely, or. Um, Anyone else in GEC of the board members uh, knows of any uh, Senator, primary election canceled? Yeah. Senator, 
Um, in uh, the Attorney General's um, op opinion, um, Guam had canceled elections in the past. So I don't know if you're referring to currently if any of the election jurisdictions have canceled elections, that I don't know. But uh, um, I, the question was asked before, and I thought I remembered, but I don't. I'm sorry. And last one uh, for the Attorney General right now is um, there was a, a New York case, Yang versus New York. And um, uh, did you have a chance to look at that at all? Yes, I did, Senator. So what was the decision there in, in the end? Um, what kind of time period were they looking at for the election and what was their final uh, decision? Uh, we reviewed that um, because it was litigation involving, there was a proposal to cancel the New York primary um, and the courts said that they could not cancel but the big distinction there was that they were not going to advance, I believe, two of the candidates. And then there were delegates. It would affect the delegates who would participate at the Democratic National Convention. So th there would actually be have been significant consequence to how the party politics were going to play out um, through the cancellation of that primary. In, in our situation, the, the proposal that we saw was for everyone to advance so that there wouldn't be, in New York, it wasn't. Uh, Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders advance to the general or to the presidential election. So I, I think it is a little bit of, a, there's a big difference between the case in New York and, and what is being currently proposed. So that provides us uh, a good understanding of what some of the differences are um, because we have looked at that and um, we're looking at some different aspects of it, but if you see that there's a difference, then all information is important for us to be able to consider. So I do have a couple of other questions, but I'll wait for the second round, Mr. Chair, so just Masi. Thank you. Senator Jim, do you have any questions for the panel, sir? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, uh, specifically uh, for Maria. Uh, all right. I, I have my notes, so I should be quick, but I had to just change one thing. I, I was gonna say good morning, Maria, but I'll just say good afternoon. Uh, Maria, I remember we were uh, talking about canceling this primary election uh, in a public hearing months ago, and the bill was uh, debated on session floor back in July, and the vote was 10 to four, and the bill to cancel the primary election back in July failed. Um, Maria, uh, four of our colleagues uh, knew and were considerate of the health of the people and the, especially the Guam election employees and it was important back in July, but now I'm glad to hear and see that it appears more people may feel the same way just a month later. So uh, Maria, I, I did discuss with you uh, my letter I wrote last week to the governor when PCOR 1 was declared and I asked the governor, what's gonna happen to the primary election? And I asked the governor to call the legislature to session and either cancel or postpone the primary. And, after all, we're supposed to stay at home for one week. And then just Saturday, this Saturday, we're supposed to go out and vote at a primary. And I would think that really defeats the purpose of the stay at home order. But Maria, just like you, I heard a media interview and the governor stating that the primary, the primary will go on even during PCOR 1. And this was reiterated again the following day by the PIO of the governor. And the governor was asked the next, uh, and was asked again that day well, uh, while explaining the executive order about PICO 1, what about the primary election? And again, the answer was the primary election shall go on. Uh, Maria, Guam, Guam Election Commission under PICO 1 has basically shut down to the public. And absentee bullet, uh, ballots or absentee voting was shut down. And that's for the safety reasons of, of GEC and plus, plus the public, and, and I commend you for, for doing that. But uh, basically, PCOR 1 um, was scheduled to end Friday, but now we know it's been extended. But, but it was scheduled to end Friday. And how in the world could we have had, a, had the primary go happen the following day? 
on, on a Saturday when basically, uh, you know, you, you folks may be on skeleton crew. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening. You know, I, I just didn't see it working at all. So what, what I'd like to know, Maria, did, did Adelaide really sit down with you, with the Guam Election Commission, before declaring PCOR 1? Was, was there a great consideration of what will happen to the primary election by declaring PCOR 1? And how can you have prepared uh, for this, with this PCOR 1 going on, and basically open your doors again, and one day next, you know, when basically uh, GEC was considered non-essential, and then you're supposed to open your doors uh, island-wide and, and have, a, have a primary election going. So if, if you can expand uh, with me so I can better understand in the preparation of declaring PCOR 1, super duper PCOR 1, was Guam Election Commission, were you really sat down and did you have the opportunity to explain to the governor what was going on? If you can kindly explain that, please. Thank you, Senator. Well, when I took this job uh, over nine years ago, one of the uh, one of the things that we discussed inside the GEC team is that the Guam Election Commission is being treated like a line agency. So we had to go around and explain to our different government partners that the Guam Election Commission is an independent and autonomous agency. The reason being is that we want to protect the sanctity of the election, making it making sure that the governor and the legislature do not interfere with the election. So in that regard, I must say, um, Senator, that, you know, I'm sure uh, both the you know, I there are conduits to both the legislature and to the governor's office and to the rest of the the government agencies for the GEC that we use. And, and we continue to dialogue. But again, because of the independence and autonomy of the election commission and not and making sure that we protect the sanctity of the election, the Guam Election Commission is governed by the board. And so with that said, ma'am, we do our, our, um, our work. We get assistance from our partners and I consider both the legislature and the governor our partners. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. So uh, understanding what you're saying and declaring pre-core one is, is basically, mm -hmm. I don't I think much, much consideration was given to that, or if there was even consideration for that, it seems to have interfered uh, with the decision of the schedule of a primary election this Saturday. Uh, and, and that's, I think, what you're inferring to, that the uh, politics is playing a role, and it is interfering with the, with the voting uh, for a, of a primary election, and that, that's pretty sad, but I'm, I'm hoping that wasn't the intent, uh, but, I, but I thank you for explaining that uh, to me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have one brief question, if I may, thank you. Uh, Maria, on Bill uh, 39, I'm sorry, 391-35, Section 3, it provides mail-in voting. And just a brief summary of it, it, it says that any registered voter in Guam Election Commission may request the Guam Election Commission to mail official ballot materials for 2020 general election. The Guam election shall also establish rules and regulations for sending mail-in ballots to registered voters who request for an official ballot for the 2020 general election no later than September 20, 2020. Now this mail-in voting for the 2020 general election uh, Maria did not have a public hearing, and the people did not provide input. So basically, the legislature, you could say, is maybe interfering to make the decision. And it's a big decision without public input. Um, I believe we have some time for public hearing, uh, like we did back in July, to discuss the first bill to cancel the primary election. So to change the primary, uh, uh, and, and by the way, you did come uh, to testify in that public hearing on the first bill. So I, I would like you to please to detail for us 
what you need and what it's going to take if this becomes law for you to, to do this. Is this at all possible? Tell me. Tell me everything that you must do in order for that to be accomplished in this bill, 391-35, please. Thank you, Senator. As I said, and I continue to say, in order to implement new strategies, new strategies, and in this case, vote by mail, please give us time to learn the process and to educate the public on the process. Putting in vote by mail at this time for the general election, there's not enough time. The Guam election cannot give it, uh, can't, cannot implement it so that we can do it come November 3rd. Thank you. Uh, Maria, uh, the question is, can you, can you please, we have a question on the floor. Can you please restate that, please? Uh, vote by mail, if enacted into law, the Guam Election Commission does not have enough time to put it in place, sir. Is that what you wanted me to say? Uh, no. We wanted to, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Pangdin, and we wanted to hear your response. That's it. Not what we wanted okay. to hear. It's what your response is. Thank you. I, I think you made it clear your response is the Guam Election Commission uh, won't be able to implement and be able to put the rules and regulations. Am I correct, Ms. Pangdin? Yes, Senator. Um, promulgating rules and regulations, if I may, will take at least 90 days because we have to go through the AAA process as well. So I wanted to make it clear that at this point, the Guam Election Commission cannot put vote by mail in place. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jim. Are, thank you. Do you have another question or you're good? No. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Madam Mr. Speaker, you, do you have a yeah, question? No, no, yeah, I just have a point of information before. A oh, point of information, okay. Yeah, please, and just for the record, uh, this is not about politics. It was a study uh, just released yesterday by the researchers from Harvard and MIT that showed from a gathering of 200 people, 90 got infected, and they spread it over 20,000 individuals. And I just want to share, if the good senator wants a copy of that, I have it here in my binder, it's right here. And I, I can share it with him. So this, this has everything to, to do with uh, science and, and research and not politics. So I just wanted to know that for the record. All right, thank you. You can just share it among all our colleagues. We're going to go now to our second round. Senator Will, do you have any questions at all to the panel? None. Senator uh, Clint, none. This is going to go through it real quick. None from this. Senator Mary, do you have any questions? Senator Tello, do you have any questions? None. Senator Luis? Senator Pito, do you have none? Senator Amanda? Senator Sabina, do you have an, another question? This is the second and final round. Yeah, just one more question. Thank you, All Mr. Right. Chair. So in regards to the, the ballots that were cast, um, do we have to, you know, should we cancel this, the primary? Uh, do we have to make any kind of uh, changes to law to address that? question is I guess for... um, may I defer that may I defer that question to my legal counsel yes uh, so that question is for mr. Seville no Jerry uh, Diaz oh, my apologies hi can you hear me <laughs> hi uh, good afternoon there's nothing in the Guam election code at this point in time that discusses this particular scenario wherein votes have been um, not officially so, cast, but people have gone in to provide their absentee ballot to the GEC. So in terms of what to do with these ballots, that's something that the legislature would have to decide. So you're saying that we would have to put something in law or what, what is your, what is your uh, recommendation? Excuse me, sorry. So I'm sorry, say that again. So if
Can you repeat your question, Senator? I apologize. I yeah, just it. to be clear, um, do, does a, a law, is a law required to address the, the ballots that have been cast already? Should the um, should the no. body cancel this election under this bill? Okay, I apologize. I was just conversing with my colleague here, who also does representation for the election commission, and so. If the election is canceled, the GEC will make a determination regarding what to do with those ballots. Uh, no law will have to be passed with regard to the handling of those of those ballots. Since it was Masi. Um, oh, wait, Senator, another if, comment? I, if I could add to that. Uh, and I agree with counsel that, that this is a very unusual situation. Uh, but 3 GCA section uh, 11134 provides that the commission is responsible for the preservation of all ballots cast um, uh, for a period of five years after the date of the election. And um, that, that seems to be, and I think that that is the only statutory authority I know of that would possibly cover these ballots. And I think that, um, excuse me, Attorney Sabo, that might only be for a valid election. I'm not sure if it applies to an election that's canceled. Okay. That you know that. But well, you're right. That is. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the only section discussing what to do with the ballots. Any ballots. Yeah. So just to, okay. to be clear, oh, was there a follow up? So just to be clear that um, right now the law does not is silent on that. And uh, basically, what what I'm hearing is that the commission will decide. But the law is silent. Yes, and we can. Yes, we can verify that there is this particular code section that Attorney Seville pointed out. But whether or not it applies to canceled elections, we'd have to verify that, and we can certainly get back to you uh, before the end of the day. Is this a recommendation no. to address that? Is there a recommendation to address that, or what the commission would have to convene to discuss this issue? At this point in time, I don't believe that the um, um, I don't believe the legislature would have to reconvene. We'll talk about it with the commission members uh, after a little bit more research on this issue, and we can provide a better uh, plan for the legislature regarding the handling of these ballots. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Therese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, so I was going to talk about the mail-in option, but I think it was made very clear just a few minutes ago that according to the Election Commission Director, the, the mail-in option uh, for the November general election is not feasible they would have to do rules and regulations. She's predicting that might take 90 days, but I think that they've also made it clear earlier that the that they wanna pursue all, all available options and make a recommendation to us about how to proceed safely for the general. And so um, I, I appreciate that. And, and um, I think the other, you know, of course, what, what uh, an, concerns have been brought to my attention also have been, you know, people want to be sure that the process will have integrity, not just as a safety factor, but the integrity uh, of those ballots, and that it's actually that voter who's voting. And uh, I've, we've seen, you know, in the nation, there's some litigation regarding mail-in, and it's not yet fully settled. Uh, so I think uh, some of the allegations were that the rules allowed for fraud that's exactly what we don't want to have in, in any type of procedure. And so I think, yeah, we might need to take some time to really vet that fully. Um, and 
they're not only <laughs> mandated by this second provision of the bill to to come up with the rules for it, but to implement it, it looks like. And that's, I think, based on everything that we've heard today, a, a supreme challenge to, to get all of that done. And especially if they want to have that process in place when they start to send out these, these ballots and they, they mentioned as early as September 19. So, um, and, and on top of all of that, for the November election, they have to deal with the COVID precautions and implement what sounds like it's gonna to need to be additional procedures to, to ensure safety. And um, okay, so now we're all looking that we can't cancel that November election and we're gonna to have to do everything we can to make it safe. So um, I think we, the legislature, have to remain available to, to work with you on this and to accept all of the options that you, or you know, to consider all the options that you might want to propose. All right, and um, I, I, I was, okay, let me just make sure. Oh, the, the other thing is that, for example, the in-office voting that, that has occurred um, in the past month, it, um, we've got eight weeks, it looks like, before the general. So in the last three weeks, they received approximately 5,300 voters. And if we use that same average of 666 per week for eight weeks, that that would not be enough to accommodate all the voters. So even that option alone um, may not be enough to handle all, all the voting that needs to occur. So yeah, we do need a, maybe a combination of things or... Um, and so, we can't get all our questions answered about how we're going to safely resolve the general election, but for, day, but for today, we need to resolve just the primary and uh, ensure that, that we are establish a clear record that there is, whether there is a, a risk of holding this primary in two days and whether there is a risk if we hold that primary on September 12th. So I tried to establish that with public health, but public health, if you could just um, maybe one more time answer for, for the two days, um, what, what is the probability that holding the primary election in two days will get us to exceed that critical care system break point? You know, uh, the Department of Public Health in partnership with, of course, uh, uh, the Guam Memorial Hospital, the JIC, the Guam Army National Guard, and so forth. You know, we stand ready to 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 build as much capacity as possible in response to the uh, pandemic. Uh, clearly, a little bit more time would actually help give a little bit more leeway to building that capacity. Um, if we were to have the election um, as currently planned, you know, we would definitely have our challenges around trying to make sure that we have the capacity and to respond to the predicted numbers uh, that would be expected. All right, well, in, I'd just like to note for the record, uh, maybe we can enter it later more formally, but the, in the governor's press conference today, she, they did discuss um, some of the capacity levels and it looked like, um, they have some very firm numbers that I would like to incorporate in the record a little later, Mr. Chair, if we get a chance. But um, all right, well, thank you again to all the panel. Thank you for answering the questions and for, for all your work to try to get this primary uh, to be safe for all of us and for the work I know you're gonna do to, to get the general safe for all of us as well. I know that's a big challenge, but thank you. Thank you, Senator Senator Kelly, do you have any more questions? This is the final round. I'm good. Uh, so, <laughs> Mr. Chair. So, uh, for public health, uh, public health is still available? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, great. So, for public health, um, according to my understanding is that the medical community is thinking that uh, this may be a new strain 
of the virus um, and that it may be more contagious. Are there any new safety measures for the community and entities like the Guam Election Commission that we should already be starting to take into consideration or do they essentially remain the same at this point? Uh, at this point, they essentially remain the same. Uh, I know that we'll be partnering with the uh, uh, Governor's Physician Advisory Group uh, to discuss any updates uh, that may lower the risk of transmission. I'm sorry. Um, could you repeat that just uh, one more time? Sure. Uh, like I said, that uh, currently they remain the same, that we will be working with the governor and the physician's advisory group to discuss any new procedures to help lower the risk of transmission. So do small, because of course, um, that reassurance is important, uh, especially since we're doing a lot of discussion about the general election. So that's going to help reassure us that moving forward, um, if there are any new protocols or anything additional, that that will be being thought of and implemented. And I know GEC has been very, very good about um, being in contact and working with the public health. So I thank both of you for that diligence. Thank you. There is also a question I have. Now, this is sort of the nuts and bolts, so I apologize for a nuts and bolts sort of question uh, for GEC. But um, somebody asked me a question, and so I'm passing it on. Would postponing or canceling the primary affect any of the expenditure reporting in any way? Um, I mean, the dates might stay the same, but does it affect any of the situations like how much one is able to raise per year, uh, do any of those dates or situations get affected? Um, Senator, thank you for asking that question. Um, I, I, that question was posed to us actually uh, a couple of days ago. So I haven't had a chance to talk with legal counsel about it, but that's where it would go. Uh, uh, and to clarify it, what we're saying is, is um, candidates were raised, the limits on candidate contributions and uh, contributions is $1,000 from an individual per election. So with the cancellation of the primary, does that $1,000 that was collected for the primary, is that does that stay and the, can they raise another thousand for the general? Um, that's, that's a question that legal counsel and I have discussed already. And we have, um, if you can give us some time to come up with the, your, the response to that one, ma'am. It's to do with Masi. Uh, again, I mean, I understand that's a nuts and bolts thing, but we want everybody to uh, have clear understandings and make sure that we're all uh, abiding by, which I know we all want to do. And so uh, I guess part of that would be also if a postponement or cancellation would change any of the, the dates that these reports are, are due by. So the um, so, Senator, uh, with regard to um, due dates of the reports, um, as you know, uh, it's 20 days in the code. It says tw uh, 10 days, I'm sorry, 10, uh -huh, 10 days after the primary. So if we don't have a primary, again, I would discuss it with the legal counsel. To do this, Masi, like I said, um, all of us want to make sure we're abiding appropriately and uh, meeting all of the dates. So um, we just want to be absolutely clear on that. Uh, so to do this, Masi, for that. And um, yeah, I think we've been pretty thorough all in all. So uh, I think that covers all of my questions. To do this, Masi, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kelly. 
Do you have any questions, Madam Speaker? Mr. Chair, I just have a comment to the panel. Comment? Just okay, because only could we just Senator Jim and then Senator, Senator Lee, and then you can panel before I okay. dismiss the panel. Senator Jim, do you have any more questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Maria, you mentioned two uh, timeframes uh, regarding the uh, mail, the mail-in uh, voting. Uh, w one, once you mentioned uh, something, uh, uh, one year, and then you also mentioned 90-day period. Can you please just reiterate both of those, please? Thank you. So the 90-day period, Senator, has to do with the promulgation of rules and regulations as it says in the in the bill, right? So we need at least 90 days to put together rules and regulations. Part of that process includes a public hearing and notice to the public that these rules are changing. With regard to the one year, the one year is to plan and implement vote by mail. Thank you, Get Maria. all the training, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Lee uh, missed you earlier. Do you have any questions, ma'am? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you to all of um, our stakeholders who are answering our questions and for hanging in with us. Um, just one last question for Director Pangolinen at GAC. Maria, um, another issue that was raised uh, previously was delays in shipping of necessary equipment to conduct our elections. And so I just wanted to ask you to repeat, uh, what are the status of these shipments and will all of this shipped equipment be available, uh, be received and, and be ready to use um, by September 12th? Thank you, Senator. Um, the equipment is here. Our tabulation equipment are here already. Um, I think, um, if I remember correctly, another another um, challenge that I had mentioned was actually the consultant, getting the consultant here on time because of the restrictions. So with regard to the equipment and to the, um, the peripherals or the other uh, parts that come to the tabulation equipment, those are all here, ma'am. And in fact, they've already been installed. Thank you. Okay, that's very helpful. So equipment and peripherals are here, um, but the consultants will not be here on time. Well, as of this morning, um, he was, as of this morning, he was able to send me a negative COVID-19 test result that I have yet to submit to public health. So if, uh, uh, if he's still required to come, he will be here uh, based on the flight itinerary he will be landing friday night here uh what that did for the guam election commission is we had to postpone our test election that was scheduled for this evening but he will be here if if need be uh, the consultant will be here for the for the tabulation on saturday night and do we have any indication maybe somebody from public health can help answer this question if this individual is um, makes his scheduled uh, flight, will there be any quarantine restrictions that would prohibit him from continuing to advise the Guam Election Commission and consult in this role? Actually, there will, there will not be. Uh, I signed off on the request uh, allowing him uh, to uh, home quarantine, so to speak, which allows him to attend the election functions and to provide uh, any counseling or support that he needs to do so. And uh, and actually, if he has his test result in hand, uh, when he arrives at the airport tomorrow night, he just simply needs to show that to the screeners and his name would already be on the list of, uh, of people that we're expecting. Thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't have really a question, because I'm not supposed to ask the question, but I need a clarification from public health. There was some data that was put out, and I, we needed to ask you to please tell us if, if it's confirmed it, it was released on the news. Oh. Uh, it, it, it dealt with the, um, 
um, confer the critical capacity at GMH. If you can please just tell us uh, it, it was broadcast, and we want to make sure that, that that's recognized. Public health. I uh, I I don't have that 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 data in front of me, but I do know that of course you know GMH uh, reached out to us uh, to uh, work with the system to make sure that there were uh, openings at the um, isolation quarantine facility for those GMH patients uh, that had tested positive and could be released out into the isofac, uh, and of course that helps take off and free rooms up at GMH. So uh, we're working through uh, the Adjutant General Agagi to uh, make sure that we have a second ISO facility opened up so that we can accommodate the new cases that are coming in. And then also keep in mind, that's not just the hospital, but when a person tests positive in their home as well, uh, the idea is that if they're not in a position to isolate themselves within a home, uh, then we bring those in too. So uh, there's, you know, with the response and many people testing positive, uh, a good number of them can indeed quarantine at home or isolate at home. Uh, but there is that uh, percentage of people who, who call in and need that assistance quarantining. So, uh, you know, right now we do have uh, the one facility with the second facility shortly on its way. And then that will help eliminate or alleviate some of the uh, uh, challenges that they're having at Guam Memorial Hospital. Sir, sir uh, what I'm specifically asking about is that uh, it was identified that um, the critical number was 15 and we're reaching that right now. And I just need to confirm if public health has communicated yeah. that with the hospital. They're at 13 right now and they're approaching that, that critical number. That would be very critical for GMH. If you just can confirm that, yes. we just need confirmation of that. Oh yeah, oh yes. We we uh, were working with uh, Dr. Uh, Uggen uh, uh, three days ago, as a matter of fact, regarding critical numbers. Because at times it will go up even higher, and then we take the pressure off by being able to move patients as room becomes available. So it it dropped down, uh, and so it, of course it's right there building up again. So so yeah. So that that number is is high and it's critical. Uh, but it's not the first time that it was critically high. It, it, uh, this week has been very challenging for all of us, and especially Guam Memorial Hospital. So we really need to make sure that, you know, ISO stands ready and that we're able to move patients um, as smoothly and as seamlessly as possible uh, so that rooms are available in the intensive care unit as well as in the emergency area. All right. Thank you, sir. Now that completes all the questions, uh, Madam Speaker, before I dismiss the panel. Thank you, Mr. The, Chair. I, I just want to take this time to extend my thank yous to the panel for being here and, and thank the uh, Guam Election Commission for taking the strong leadership and stand to extend the letter to uh, the both of us and to the governor to literally give us the opportunity to do what we are elected to do. And as I said earlier, this was at the request of the Guam election commissions. I just want to say thank you to the, all the panel, Public Health, Office of the Attorney General, and, and of course the Guam Election Commission and everybody on the panel for, for staying here for literally more than five hours to work closely with us as we do, as we will take the time to deliberate on this measure and vote uh, and see if we can get the vote for this measure. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me the opportunity ask the author of this bill to thank the panel here uh, this afternoon. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the panel. Um, uh, you're now dismissed, and please be safe, travel safe, and um, thank you for all what you do. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Madam Speaker, thank you, Senators. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Now, um, Thank my you colleagues, um, we will now proceed to floor amendments. I have copies of several amendments, but I'll ask you if we can just take a five minute recess so I can warm up a little bit. Okay, got the air con straight at me. Just five minutes, all right? Thank you. We'll take a five minute recess.
Committee of the Whole is called back to order. Um, we have, my colleagues, we have four amendments. We will begin with the first amendment that was submitted by Senator Kelly Marsh Titano. Ma'am, if you would read your amendment. Seduce Masi, Mr. Chair. The amendment is for line seven, page two, to add a new section four to read. Section four, logistical support. The governor shall provide logistical support resources, including the detailing of any government personnel as needed to the Guam Election Commission in order to ensure a safe and successful 2020 general election. So if, if I could just mention, if I think we've learned anything right now is that it's unpredictable. And with the general election, as we've talked about, there is no postponing it. There is no canceling it. If we find ourselves in a situation similar to this, there have to be plan A, plan B, plan C. There have to be options. And so we heard things like there are 50 workers who are either not confirming, they're not um, showing up, or they've dropped out. Uh, I, I, I just think, you know what, we've been talking about the need for flexibility, the need for uh, just having all options available, that if we're committing that additional set of tools, the governor has 11,600 employees, the governor has CARES Act money, the governor has tools that GEC simply does not have. And so if they know that those tools are in place, if they are working together early on and, and making sure that the plans for whatever may come their way have already been thought out, people have already been trained, all the alternates, let's say, or whatever the situation might be, I just feel that they need every tool available, they need all flexibility available, because there is no coming back for emergency session and deliberating this. Um, the election will have to take place. So I, I just advocate for giving the Guam Election Commission all the support that we can from this body uh, to, to set basically the whole government as is needed um, at their disposal to a degree uh, so that they have their plan A, their plan B, and their plan C. Uh, so I hope for everybody's favorable condition, uh, excuse me, <laughs> favorable uh, consideration. Thank you, Senator Kelly. On the motion to amend, does any of my colleagues like to speak to that motion? Senator, ma Madam Speaker. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I, I want to say uh, just reading this amendment and my personal intent to support it, I just want to make sure that uh, I look at the organicity of this and, and uh, I just want to make sure we don't get sued, you know, that, that we as policymakers are telling, are forcing the governor to provide that support during uh, electoral process. Maybe the author can speak on that. I'm, j I'm just wanting to make sure. Maybe we can just get clarification just because. Uh, I support the intent. I, I just want to make sure that we're not going to, something's not going to come down our way. Please. So. Senator Kelly. So yes, so I, I will get legal opinion um, because there may also be other ways to it's, word it to support the intent. Cause, right. Yeah. Okay, so if I could have a moment recess. Okay, a moment recess so you can get legal, Thank please. You. Thank you. Recess. Give me the whole on recess.
Committee of the Whole is uh, back on order. Senator Kelly, on your amendment, please. Sutu Ismasi, Mr. Chair. So um, after consulting with legal, um, we're adjusting the language just a bit. So to read it from beginning to end, section four, logistical support. The governor shall, to the extent practicable, provide logistical support, resources, including the detailing of any governmental, excuse me, government personnel as needed to the Guam Election Commission in order to ensure a safe and successful 2020 general election. Thank you, Senator Kelly. On the motion, are there any objection or any, my colleagues want to speak? There being none, are there any objection? There are no objection. Uh, Senator, Ke Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to have a very, very brief discussion on why we would why we would go forward with shall to the greatest extent practical instead of may. The governor may, and then it would allow for this sim similar sharing of resources because we did hear from, I believe, the director of the CEC or members of the CEC board that there are limited um, with certain government officials participating and and i understand why they would not want cabinet members to be precinct officials that does make make sense in my mind and so i want to make sure that one if we're going to be mandating somebody to do something that we give them the resources to do that um legislate that but then also just give them some flexibility. Because I, I understand wanting to make sure that all the bases are covered and we do have a free and fair general election, but I think this may have unintended consequences. So are you proposing to change the word shall to me for, for discussion? Uh, are there any... Uh... Any of my colleagues would like to speak? Senator Tello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to make an amendment to, to that uh, amendment, and that is just from uh, change the word shall to me. My colleagues, there's an amendment to the amendment. Okay, let's just stay focused. The first amendment is the, just the simple shall, and her amendment would add the, to the extent practicable, and the amendment to that, as we open for discussion. Okay, no, but we're already open for discussion, and that was asked. There was no objection to it, and, and that's why I just wanted to discuss that. And then that's why there was a motion to amend, to change the word shall to me. All right, all right. Um, if, if, if that's required, I'll just, there are no objections to the, the initial amendment, even though we already know we're going to have an amendment to the amendment. So... Being that there's no objection, no, no, no. Senator Tello. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'm, uh, there um, is an amendment to her amendment. That's correct. Okay, if you gavel down. No, you didn't gavel down yet. Yeah, Not yet. Or, or even, you know, want to uh, gavel down on her, her amendment that she made, which maintains the shall, and then I come in to make an amendment to that, it doesn't make any sense. So, Mr. Chair, I think the way it's going right now is first, the question is, did she make an amendment to her amendment? Yes. I mean, okay, yes. So, yes, she did. So, um, and and then I'm I, and I know that we can't make an amendment to an amendment to an amendment, correct? So I think it would probably be I think it would probably be in order if we could just take a recess to re read, <laughs> you know. Oh, make sure you stay at distance. 
Why don't we just take a quick recess and the two of you discuss whatever you need to. Thank you. Committee is called back to order. We regroup. Senator Tello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, after discussing this with the author of the amendment, I'm going to withdraw my, my uh, uh, amendment to the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any objections to that withdrawal? There are none. Thank you. Senator Kelly. Yes, I shall also withdraw my amendment so that I can just introduce it clean. Thank you. No objection. Done. Senator Kelly, now your amendment, please. Situus Mossy, Mr. Chair. So the amendment now reads line seven, page two, to add a new section four to read. Section four, logistical support. The governor may, to the extent practicable, provide logistical support resources, including the detailing of any government personnel as needed to the Guam Election Commission in order to ensure a safe and successful 2020 general election. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Are there any objection on the motion? Are there any objection to the motion? There being none, motion passes. Moving now to Senator Tello's amendment. Ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I proffer an amendment on line seven uh, to twelve. Well, no, line seven to twelve, page two, and it's to delete section three of the bill. Section three is uh, mail-in voting, and it states, notwithstanding any of the provisions of law, rules, regulations, or registered voter of the Guam Election Commission may request the Guam Election Commission to mail official ballot materials for the 2020 general election. The Guam Election Commission shall establish rules and regulations for sending mail-in bandits to registered voters who request for official ballot for the 2020 general election no later than September 20th, 20, 2020. And my amendment again is to strike out this section of, of the bill. And as my colleagues know and heard from, from the uh, 
director of the uh, Guam Election Commission, even from their uh, board members, that it would be very difficult at this time to, to do something like this. And, uh, but I think it's something in the future for them to consider, but we know it's gonna take several months and maybe even a year it was stated to get something like this going. So it's very simple. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tello. On the motion, does anyone like to discuss this motion? Senator Therese. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I support the motion, yeah, to delete this section. Um, I think uh, the Election Commission was very clear in addition to what my colleague s stated, but she's, they also stated that they have been actively looking at other alternatives to make this general election that's coming up safer, including you know, increasing polling sites so that it's a little bit more dispersed, um, trying to get voting centers. She's talked to us about that several times, but, uh, but it's also very clear that they have not formally investigated those or formally adopted it as a board uh, as recommendations for the legislature. And because these are, again, subject to litigation, Throughout the nation, I want they need they're going to be have to be very thorough, and even the attorney general alluded to that today. So I support the removal, the deletion of the mail-in provision of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Senator Therese. Are there any objection to the most? Are there any objection to this amendment? There being none. Amendment passes. Now to uh, an amendment introduced by. Senator Mary uh, Torres, uh, co-sponsored by Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, and uh, co-sponsored by Senator Kelly uh, Titano. Senator Torres. Thank you. My amendment is to page two, and it is to add new sections to the bill. The first section is titled Personal Delivery of Ballot for 2020 General Election. And if I may uh, proceed to read it, Mr. Chair. Please do. Thank you. Notwithstanding 3 GCA section 10107, the Guam Election Commission shall deliver a ballot to any qualified elector applying in person at the office of said commission, provided that such applicant shall complete and subscribe the application heretofore prescribed by 3 GCA chapter 10, provided, however, that said application shall not be made provided, however, that said application shall be made not more than 45 days nor less than one day before the date of the election for which the vote is being cast. It is provided further that said ballot shall be immediately marked, enclosed in ballot envelope, placed in the return envelope with proper affidavit enclosed, and immediately returned to the commission. This provision shall apply only to the 2020 general election. An additional section titled Permitting Absentee Voting for All Qualified Voters. Notwithstanding 3 GCA section 10101, any qualified voter of Guam may vote in the 2020 general election during the 45-day in-office absentee voting period as provided for under this act and to further allow legislative counsel to make technical corrections and to renumber sections accordingly. So essentially, Mr. Chairman, what, this, what these um, amendments do is it extends the 30-day period for early voting and absentee voting an additional 15 days. Um, as we were listening to the panel before us, Time was the one factor that would allow the GEC to get things in order. But I think more than anything, if you consider what giving an additional 15 days for absentee or in-house voting does, is it lessens, theoretically it lessens the number of voters that eventually would turn out on election day. So the idea of providing uh, one measure of safety for voters is expanded uh, through these sections, uh, through these amendments to these sections. And so I would encourage my um, 
my colleagues to support it. And then also, we arrived at the 45 days in consultation with the Guam Election Commission because uh, the 40, not more than 45 days does allow them to meet all the deadlines that are mandated uh, in the general election. And so 45 days was a practical day for them to um, meet their deadlines and to act. So, um, so that was also vetted with the Election Commission prior to this submission. Thank you, Senator Torres. Do any of my call on the motion, does any of my colleagues want to discuss that? Senator Therese, you raise your hand, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I support the amendment of changing from uh, the law that we just passed. Uh, I think it was Public Law 35 dash. Yeah, and that said, it was just a Senator Titano's law that had 30 days, and that's what we have been implementing prior to the primary. And so this would change it to 45 days. Uh, and and it, it also limits it just to the Um, sorry for the fiscal. I mean, for the general, for the year, the voting year, 2020, which which is good. I guess my only question is just to legal. That's why I'm going back and forth. It's because of that law that we just passed, and then we implement. I mean, we passed this. I think that last section is identical, except for the 30 or 45 days. I'm not sure why we're not just amending the law that we just passed, and then the first section wasn't in the prior law we passed because I think it's it's the same as the, um, the you know the current procedures that they use for they call this absentee voting but um, I'm gonna leave that to legal so but that's I, I support the 30 to 45 days thank you mr. Chair. thank mr. you mr. chair I can I can S kind of speak to that. Uh, there was a reason that we we did the two sections and one was we had to waive both uh, section 10101, which is the, uh, regarding the qualified uh, for absentee voting, and then 10107, which is the one that restricts the in-office absentee voting to not more than 30. So one section was who is qualified and, and the other was uh, one specific to in-office uh, in absentee voting. So that's why we, we addressed it that way. All right, thank you. Any other, on the motion, any other discussion? They're being done. Are there any objection to the motion? Senator, Senator Kelly, do you want to speak on this? Suju so Smasi, and I um, appreciate the author of this amendment, um, and the amendment does maximize the time. So I, I appreciate the author um, being very thoughtful and allowing me to be a co-sponsor to this. Uh, that we can build and expand upon the 30 days and uh, give a little bit more time. And GEC talked about um, being able to expand their efforts and, and build on it. So we're hoping that this is really going to um, serve the community well. I just had one question, and it may be something that um, the author was able to talk out with the Guam Election Commission. Um, is with the homebound voting, is is this part of the 45 days? Does the does um, the in office voting in the way that it's written here? Does that also give them the additional time for the homebound voting, or perhaps maybe um, that wasn't necessary, and the 30 days is still enough? Um, I just want to. Uh, I know the author has good intentions and she wants to serve the community um, as best possible. So I, I just wanted to be able to ask that about the homebound uh, voters. All right, Senator Kelly, we're talking about the motion only. Anything else or surrounding outside of that? <laughs> it's not on the motion. So the, mo the motion is about the 45 days. If you want to talk about the homebound and all that stuff, that may be in another area. It it's and because so, the amendment says specifically in person at the office. Yeah. So I just, right, 
their absentee voting also considers homebound. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering if GEC doesn't need the extra 15 days for the homebound or if, if this does indeed include the, the homebound. So, so, yes, Senator Torres, maybe you may answer that because yes. I only see it as 15, adding 15 more days. Yeah. So, I believe I believe it, it does satisfy it with regard to Section 10107, which is dealing with the uh, absent in office and absentee voting. But the uh, the main concern about the deadline, you know, going with 45 as opposed to 60, was specifically the um, the federal regulation for mailing out ballots to the soldiers. But in terms of, of everybody else that falls into absentee and in-house voting, they would be covered under these two sections, and that's why we addressed it specifically in those sections. Okay, so you, you want to ask legal? Yes, I, I know the author. Um, okay, we'll, we'll take a few minutes. Rec out, so. Senator Lee? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just a point of, um, of information for everyone. Uh, I was receiving a, a message from the GEC, and they deemed that personal delivery of ballot section applies to in office and homebound. So, Senator Torres is correct. That covers it all, Senator Kelly. Do you, do you, I don't think you need. You got the message from GEC. Do you still need to meet with okay. legal? Okay. Well, and and I'm glad to have that clarification because I know the author wouldn't want to leave them out, and and I didn't either. So I wanted to make sure that it was uh, legally correct. All right. Thank you, Senator okay, Kelly. Okay. Thank you, um, Senator Sabina Paris. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a point of inquiry regarding uh, the definition of days. Is that uh, working days or is that calendar days? And the reason I ask is because um, we still have to determine what to do with the cast ballots for the uh, primary election. And would that give them enough time to deal with that before we move on in the voting process? This is about the general election? You're talking about the primary? This is about the general. They don't? Okay. Senator Sabina? The top of the amendment is about the general election, so. Yes, uh, yeah, I understand that completely. I just um, wanted to give them enough time, the GEC, enough time to determine what to do with the cast votes uh, should the, we cancel the primary election and you know whether the 45 days cuts into that time. That's just All my right. concern. Okay, Senator Torres, could, could you yes. answer that question, yes. please? Mr. Chair, as, as we recall, when we passed Public Law 3595, which is uh, Senator Kelly Marsh's uh, bill, the, um, we, it was really discretionary on the GOC. It's their prerogative to determine what those, what those number of days are, 45 days, whether it includes calendars, days, or all days of the week. So the consideration here is, exact, is the exact same consideration as the original bill, 30, uh, public law 3595. And, and, and then again, I just want to reiterate that um, GEC felt that this was more than sufficient, the 45 days. Thank you. Sen Senator Sabina, did that pretty much answer the question, ma'am? It did. Uh, just, um, yeah, just wondering if that's a concern. All right. Okay. On the motion to the amend, motion to amend, are there any objection? There being none, motion passes, amendment is in place. Senator Therese Terlai. Ma'am, the last amendment on, on the record. Okay, Senator Therese, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, it's an um, amendment titled TMT line seven, page two. And in place of the sec section that was just deleted by one of my colleagues uh, to put this in, and it would require a safety plan for 2020 general elections be submitted to the legislature no later than September 14, 2020, so that we can have more assurance, Mr. Chair, and that we're not, um, you know, guessing all the way up to that. I know they're going to have to 
it, it may improve up to the general, but we really want to know right away that this is this is that they have maximized their efforts. Uh, so it says that. Uh, the Guam Election Commission shall adopt a resolution which details the Commission's safety measures and mitigation efforts to ensure a safe 2020 general election. The resolution may also include recommendations for alternative voting practices, including but not limited to mail-in voting or voting centers for the 2020 general elections for legislative action. The director of the Election Commission shall transmit a report to the Speaker of the Legislature in Guam no later than September 14, 2020. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. On the motion to amend, does any of my colleagues would like to speak on that motion? There being none, are there any objections to the, mo to, to the amendment? There being none, motion passes. My colleagues, there are no further amendments in the drive with that. I'd ask the sponsor to please uh, proceed to close. Or stand by, before you proceed to close, um, one of the senators did ask, wanted to speak to the bill, reference to the bill, and I would like to allow him. Senator Will Castro, sir. Mr. Chairman, on the main motion, Hutatsu Satihu Sopopote Estina Priniponi. I rise in opposition to any proposal that would outright cancel the primary election of 2020. And while my reasons are many, most of which I articulated on the floor in prior session, today in particular, I stand in acknowledgement of the over 2,200 voices that have been registered in this primary partisan election. Whether it was to choose a candidate for mayor or, or vice mayor, to even affirm their support for their respective senator, or even to vote for their delegate to the United States House of Representatives based on his or her platform, political ideology, or some other factor that would have advanced the candidate as the sole candidate for their party onto the general election. Mr. Chairman, for candidates like myself, it may not alter the course of my trajectory to advance to the general election. But there are offices, whether they're Republican or Democrat, within each of those parties that have multiple contenders. In addition to those who have spoken through their ballots, it is for those voices that are silenced in today's deliberations, my family, my household as an example, that I wish to speak out for. It's on behalf of those mayoral candidates like Tony Tsagula from Inalahan, or mayoral candidate James Santos in Jigu, both of whom I have communicated directly with and others from throughout the island who share our sentiments. It's on behalf of those who've taken the time out to vote before they may have gone off island, or those who took the time to make arrangements to, the go, to go to GCIC and register their votes in advance to avoid the large crowds. I believe that their votes will have a material contribution to the outcome of that primary contest thus ballot placement for the general election. Mr. Chairman, I acknowledge and I too am saddened by the spike of these COVID cases. I personally know of two individuals who contracted the virus. And as I fully disclose, I contracted the virus. One of those cases may have contracted the virus performing essential duties behind the fence on military construction projects, while the other may have been working as an entrepreneur. But either way, Mr. Chairman, none of them, to include myself, caught the virus either at a grocery store, a rosary, or a funeral. Suffice it to say, it was in the performance of our duties, and it's presumed, it is presumed, at our work site. And so my point is that the key to greater prevention, and we heard this affirmed by the Department of Public Health, the key to greater prevention and the spread of the disease rests with each of us in our respective individual capacities as residents, as government managers, as, as business owners, to ensure that we provide a low-risk condition for our loved ones and the general public, to limit our movement and exposure, to practice good hygiene and protocols wherever we may be. I was COVID positive and have since been released, but before then, since the onset of the virus into this community, my family has done as much as it could 
to protect my father, my children's papa from contracting the virus. We avoid kissing him, we avoid touching him. We do as much as we can do. I even avoid getting too close and, I'm, and I guminet gikusin and sanhizun. I even try to keep a safe distance, Mr. Chairman, when having a beer with I, my old man in the outside kitchen. March, April, May, June, July, August, I've contracted the virus and he has not. He lives in the adjacent living space. This is the power of individual responsibility. The only possible way I foresee my father catching COVID, I suppose, is when he takes it upon himself to go to the exchange or the commissary because he likes to do that despite my advice. And that's his individual choice. But one thing is certain, Mr. Chairman, he certainly hasn't and will not catch it from his son. Ipuntu. Zengenman Mountain Hamzu Nai put a sting na mamela na permit na election. Pues na saga Hamzu Nai gigo mamu. Na saga gi office na mizu. Put masaya hafa na sisita para familiam mo. Hafa na sisita na sisita pun sogi para hago. Hago disidi. Loke hajiao. Na posangani hafa no mas importante. Put guaho puri famagonhu. Puri tatao. Senor Chairman Estahu na halom ibotu kan todo i familia ko lokwe estahu na halom iboten niha. Pues hafa pago tatsanda yet kun zuti todo nu ibaloten familia ko na para pun edzu na rason Mr. Chairman hu tatsu Senor Timalago jo et mas kahilo munga mo na lebo kifeno o Timalago na pun mumuhit guini. Lozangin hu five fisin. Edzu siya imat ufashot di pano. Mano gai gi siya. Fanaan na naman upitati. Benti pun songonyo na gai gi siya gi tsetson niya. Gi ufisin niya. Atan po ago. Mano gai gi at. Mano gai gi zuk, Mr. Chairman. Gi guma itaw taw tano. Look at where I'm at. I'm not in the hall with you. Not because I'm a public health threat, Mr. Chairman, but because out of an abundance of caution. I choose to be here. I chose to show up. I chose to honor and respect my fellow man. And I share this. I share this with a greater hope that it serves as a vignette into the issue that's really facing this community. I maintain that with the proper social distancing, Mr. Chairman, and the extra precautions as I experience at the Guam Election Commission, we can have a safe primary election. While throwing out the primary altogether is not acceptable to me, delaying it would have given us that much more time to prepare. And at the end of the day, I want my constituency to know that I believe it's your right to vote, should you choose to exercise it. And consistent with that is your privilege not to have to participate for whatever reason. But let it be known, it's certainly my duty to protect the votes that you had already registered. Let me be clear in my conviction. For me, I certainly don't weigh one's privilege to go to the grocery store or some construction superstore or the gas station or even to your job site as having greater value than voting. I'm sorry. I don't wish to debate needs versus wants, Mr. Chairman. That's not my point. My point is that I do believe that we can do more to safeguard the life and safety of those who chose to come out and vote in the primary or general elections. If, in fact, it is what you want to do, if the political will is there. What's also not for debate, Mr. Chairman, is my conviction that to outright throw out 2,200 votes or change the rules of the game for contested positions where it may create an unfair advantage or materially compromise one candidacy is just not right. And I'm not stuck on whatever alternative is best, whether, whether we want to let the party system decide or delay the primary election. But again, I am firm that any mitigation strategy to preserve those primary votes registered is better than throwing in the towel and throwing away our people's votes. Before I close, I want to thank former Senator Tony Ada, the chairman of the Republican Party at Guam. Thank you for stepping up and speaking out publicly against discarding the 2,200 votes cast or registered with the Election Commission and throwing out the primary election altogether. Mr. Chairman, and in closing, 
I do want to wish everyone the best of health in the days and the weeks ahead. I encourage everyone to look out for our manamko and those whose health conditions place them at greater risk. God be with you all. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Senator Will. I will now ask the sponsor, Madam Speaker, to close. Um, okay. Make Mr. Chair, I, I did have a closing, but I'll go right. ahead and leave that for the extension of remarks. And in the interest of time, uh, I move that, uh, first of all, say thank you to everybody and, and my colleagues who uh, made the amendments necessary to move this bill forward. And again, thank the panel that uh, appeared before us uh, this afternoon uh, to answer all the increase that we may have had. So at, with that, Mr. Chair, I move that uh, we rise from the Committee of the Whole with the recommendation to place 39135LS as amended be placed in the third reading file and to vote without engrossment. On the motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole, with the recommendation, are there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. We stand in recess. Yeah, I know. Half a day, colleagues. Imina Trentai Cinco Nalas Laturanguahan is back from recess. Um, Senator San Augustine. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to report back to the body that Bill. 391-35 LS as amended in the Committee of the Whole with the recommendation to place on third reading file and vote on without engrossment. On that motion, without any objection, motion carries. Madam Clerk, roll call. Senator Castro. Mungo. Senator Castro, nay. Senator Lee. Pass. Senator Lee, pass. Senator Marsh Titano. Senator Marsh Titano, pass. Senator Moylan. Aye. Senator Moylan, aye. Senator Munya. Senator Munya, nay. Speaker Munya Barnes. Hungan. Speaker Munya Barnes, aye. Vice Speaker Nelson. Hungan. Vice Speaker Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Hungan. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rogel. Aye. Senator Rogel, aye. Senator San Augustine. Pass. Senator San Augustine, pass. Senator Shelton. Hungan. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Hungan. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Pito Terlahi. Senator Pito Terlahi, aye. Senator Therese Terlahi. Hungan. Senator Therese Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Hungan. Senator Torres, aye.
Senator Lee. Pass. Senator Lee, pass. Senator Marsh Titano. Ahi. Senator Marsh Titano, nay. Senator St. Augustine. Again. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Lee. Again. Senator Lee, aye. Colleagues, Bill number 391-35LS received 12 ayes and 3 nays. Bill number 391-35LS is duly passed by this body. Colleagues, uh, we are now at brief extension of remarks. Does anyone wish to present uh, any extension of remarks at this time? It, Senator Joseph Augustine. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would just like to, maybe I don't even need to, but I'm gonna go ahead and state it, why I voted yes to cancel the, the, the primary election. Number one, um, I've always uh, pursued to uh, eliminate the primary. But just recently, I supported a bill that, that would have the primary. But at the time also, the condition, the health condition of, of the people of Guam was not, as, not the way it is today. And number one, uh, canceling the primary does not deny you the right to vote. And some may say, uh, somebody was out there saying, even in war, sure, even in war. As a, as a veteran and a retired military uh, individual, I support the right to vote. But when it's, when it's first to save lives and prevent any further casualty, that's my first vote, is to protect the lives of the people of Guam and to not cause panic and to be told that you caused me to have to vote. No. I want you to stay safe. I want to see you at the next election. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator St. Augustine. Anyone else wishing to present extension of remarks? Senator, uh, Vice Speaker Nelson, can you please approach? Speaker Barnes, you are recognized. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to take this time to thank all my colleagues for coming in today as we do our duty for the people of Guam, uh, moving forward, keeping in the spirit of collegiality and, and collaboration. And 
I hope we can, can continue uh, to work together and come to common grounds, uh, uh, even during the deliberations we're on right now uh, as it relates to the budget. I also can't emphasize enough that with our fight against COVID, it really takes all of us to come together as a community and as a people so that we can co combat uh, COVID-19 rapidly and begin the recovery uh, process. We've all sacrificed as we fought the first wave, and yet we are here again today. Our actions now will determine the fate of our people, whether we live or die from COVID-19, or if we will continue to suffer from this economic downturn. I want to impart on each of us here today and also to our people that our future, especially with regards to COVID-19, <clears throat> it rests with each and every one of us. I pray, Madam Speaker, for all those currently recovering from COVID-19, and I join our island in expressing our deepest condolences to those who lost a loved one from COVID-19. I also want to extend my thoughts and prayers to all our fellow Americans in the states of Louisiana. We, I just found out are facing an, imp, an impeding uh, storm, the strongest, I believe, uh, in their history, as well as the first responders from all over the nation who are already beginning to be mobilized to respond to Hurricane Laura. I also want to take the time to thank our people here, the first responders, but just everybody here. We, um, this invisible war, we, we really want to see it go away. But we don't know what that timeline is. And I know that with our faith and belief that we can continue to work together, that we will overcome this ordeal. So I just want to take this time to extend my own uncle and the Masi, and I can't emphasize, emphasize this enough, but I believe in my heart we will overcome this. But we can only do that, Madam Speaker, if we continue to do it together. So God bless all of us. God bless Guam and God bless the people of the world. Be safe. Thank you. This time, colleagues, I'll recognize uh, Majority Leader uh, Vice Speaker Nelson. You are recognized. Sitas Masi, Madam Speaker, just an announcement that we will be continuing our budget hearing as indicated from the good chair at 20 hundred hours this evening via Zoom. And uh, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn this session subject to call of the speaker. Thank you. On that motion, are there any objections? Hearing or seeing, none. Motion carries. God bless.